You know, one of the things that we miss sometimes when we read the Bible is we see these stories about 3,000 converted or whatever. But probably the way the church grew was because a Christian talked to a non-Christian in the marketplace, you know, at work or wherever. So in a way, we are all called to be evangelists. That doesn't mean we're evangelists, because some people have a special charism or gift to do that. But we are all called to be evangelists in some way, and neighbors or whatever, in terms of a witness. What's the famous quote from... Preach the gospel wherever you go, and that's their use word. Does anybody know it? St. Francis? Yes. Preach the gospel wherever you go. That's yes. That's their use but some, But... You, you do have to mention the fact that the reason you're showing the good example is because of Jesus. Otherwise, how are people going to know what's the source of your grace? Um, so, what I'm going to do is share just a quick synopsis of my conversion story. Um, and Ellen will probably share a little bit like that. And then what are the things like Father McDonald did, which I have to tell you, I was really amazed at his sharing, how open he was in terms of letting himself kind of out there, you know, because uh, I've known him for a long time, and I learned a few things that I didn't know either, so you, you all have been privileged, and the staff, most of the staff thought the same thing. He's mellow since he's been here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I was raised a Lutheran. I was baptized, quote, believed as a teenager, but I fell away. I became an agnostic. You all know what an agnostic is? Somebody who basically says, I don't know if there is a God, but I'm not a, an atheist saying, I'm not going to deny the existence of God. I'm not that prideful. Um, but it's like, oh, you know, who cares? Uh, but I, I was always concerned about the meaning of life. And um, I studied other faiths and... Uh, we moved to Utah, and my wife will share that she had prayed that we would be moved somewhere where I would convert. <laughs> and of all places to move, you know, Utah, where there are a large number of Mormons. In fact, we looked at two towns. One town, 90% of the people in the town were Mormons. Um, but the, the place we settled in was about half and half, because there are a lot of people from Texas and oil shale. And so we met some good Christians, and... Um, socialized with them and they had a Bible study and I said oh I'll go for Ellen's sake you know religion's a crutch you know I don't need that da 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 um, but I came to a point in my life and I shared a little bit before where I really believed that there after studying all the religions and everything there were two choices either I might as well be a hedonist or Jesus was real well you know it's obvious what I chose <laughs> and I could tell a difference immediately in my life, when I made that choice. It was a very conscious choice. Um, one is my language changed. You didn't hear foul language coming out of my mouth. It was just like that. And there were two things that were very clear to me. It's not like I heard voices, but it was two things to move back near family and to find other strong Christians to be around, which we did. And that's a long story, 20 year history, but anyway, that I won't go into. Uh, but that helped in my formation after I became a Christian. In all that, I, I sometimes, I, always in my mind, there's been this thought that my grandmother was praying for me. As strange as that may seem, that's always been with me, that idea that probably I wouldn't have converted if it wasn't for her prayers. Um, of course, she was a Lutheran, so I'm not so sure how happy she is. <laughs> but... Uh, you know, I really had that sense that she was uh, praying for us. Um, so we moved back here, and of course Ellen was Catholic, and she was a strong Catholic at that point. Um, and so that was influencing me, but at that point, I was, no way was I going to become a Catholic. You know, that was the last thing on my list to, to look at. So I visited different churches, and I just sensed this awe and reverence in the Catholic Church. It just, I couldn't get away from it. So I was just led to explore. And I will tell you, it wasn't easy because I go to some sessions where literally I was told things and I'd say, wait a minute, if that's what the church believes, I can't be Catholic. But then I'd have to go back and read the catechism and, 
And it all got straightened out, and the Lord brought me into the church. So what do I like about the church? And, you know, part of that journey is I, I have, there was a group of professors in Wichita State, of all places, and they taught great books course. And lots of people, lots of students were converting to the Catholic Church. And they didn't preach religion or anything. But part of it, I think, is they were teaching truth. And when we talk about the fullness of the truth, we really believe that. That doesn't mean we have all the answers, but we have the fullness of the truth that God has revealed to us here on earth. And what I see happen so often for us is we find part of the truth, the part that we're comfortable with. And we stop. We stop seeking. Because if you're seeking truth, it should make you uncomfortable. And if you're not uncomfortable, then you probably need to look at what have I done? What have I chosen? So what do I like about the church? I love the liturgy. You know, I love the way it involved the senses, all of our senses, and it's meant to. I, I can't tell you how many times I've been blessed by sitting in the, in the church in terms of processing in, and there's incense and light coming through the stained glass windows, and seeing that incense in the air, and just gives me a real sense of mystery. So I love the liturgy and the sense of mystery that it brings, if, if you're really thinking about it. it. Father Munn, who was an Episcopal priest who became Catholic, he used to say, you know, too often is what we think is, this is the normal world. And then I go to Mass. Uh-uh. Because if you think about it, what is the Mass like? The Mass is like eternity. This is a blink of an eye. But the Mass is like eternity. That's more like the real world. So think about that sometime when you're in the church. That really, this is what it's really going to be more like. Now, we don't know exactly, but it's going to be more like that than what's out here. And I love the fact that we have different rites. I don't know how many of you know that. You know, there's different rites. They're all Catholic, but there's different flavors. <clears throat> what we do here is a Latin rite. But there's Melkite right, Maronite right, you know, there's a 20-something, I think it's 22 at last count, different rites. And part of it is they, they, you know, the church would get isolated. You've got to remember geography. You know, the Christian church, there were little pockets, and sometimes because of what was going on in the world, they would get isolated, and they didn't necessarily have communication with the rest of the church. And they, so they would maintain certain traditions or change. But they're all connected to us. And John Paul would talk about the fact that the Latin rite tends to give us really good theology. Whereas the Eastern tends to give us mystery. And you need both. You know, when we say the creed, that is not the sum of God. Remember that. It's what we need as human beings. We have to break it down because we can't comprehend the infinite. And that's why you should hear a lot about mystery in the church. Because we can't comprehend God, really. Because all we can comprehend is aspects of God. We can, Jesus came down, God came down in the flesh, because that's something we can concretely see, observe, in a sense, that we can identify with. But God is infinite. So how can we ever reduce the infinite to words? But we need that. But we need more than just the words. That's why we have liturgy incense and all that, in terms of all that's supposed to point towards God. I love the fact that Jesus picked St. Peter to be the first pope. You know why? Because in many ways he was a jerk. If you go back and read, I mean, what did he do? He denied Jesus. And you know what that says to me? He was in our face of the fact that, you know what, you can't do this without me. Without Christ as the center, you can't lead the church. And it took Peter a while to get it. But he finally got it. And even then, when you look at the last words in terms of feeding my sheep, where Jesus talks to Peter, you can understand, if you really read that carefully, even then, Peter hasn't fully gotten it. 
Because, you know, he's just been tasked with this new responsibility. And given, but he's been given the grace to do it. But it takes a while. And I love the fact that he picked Paul. Because well, Paul, what is Paul doing? He's persecuting. He's trying to kill off the Christians. Because you know what Paul thought? He thought all those Christians, were, they were just a bunch of heretical Jews. And they need to be squashed. And God knocked him off his horse. I love the fact that God picked those people. Because it shows us that it's not them. It's not about Peter. It's not about Paul. It's about God. It's about Jesus and what he's doing through them. And if you look at the saints, how many of you know about St. Augustine? You all heard of him, right? One of the fathers of the church. I mean, his teachings were fundamental to the faith. Besides, I mean, you know, Paul was really the first in terms of really fundamental teachings to our faith. But Augustine was one of the next ones who's just really, I mean, there, there's a bunch along the way but just really foundational. You know what he was? He was a womanizer before he came to the faith. So God is he's picking people who will say yes and all recognize their sinfulness, just like when Jesus was talking. What was the problem with the Pharisees? They couldn't recognize that they needed Jesus. The sinners and the, the people he hung around with, they knew what they were. They had the humility to recognize who they were. I just love that fact. And the other saints who, who set examples like that. The church is full of saints who were horrible people at some time. Doesn't that give us hope? <laughs> we're all called to be saints. Now, not necessarily great saints that are recognized. And who knows how many, you know, one of the things is the danger is we think, oh, these are the saints and that's it. Now, there's probably lots of saints out there. They just never came to the attention of the church in a big way. But God knew. Jesus knew. And you know what a saint is, by the way, when I throw that out? Anybody? Converts? Or, huh? Well, but, but a saint is somebody that the church says, they're in heaven. You know, we can't say that about everyone. Somebody dies. We can't say that, but saints are people that the church has said, yes, these people are in heaven. All right, history. I love the church history. And as Father McDonald shared, you know, I, I taught history to an adult ed group, and I'm probably going to do it here because a lot of people have asked to, to go through that. And I start out by saying it's a bloody, awful mess because it was. I mean, there's a lot of horrible things, it's true, done in the name of Christianity. Of course, that wasn't Christian what they did. But it was done, quote, in the name of Christianity. Um, and that's one of the mysteries of our church is because the church, what do we say about the four marks? Of, one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. Well, how can it be holy when you look at some of these folks? Me, you know? Because when we are faithful to Jesus, we are part of, and following Jesus, we are part of the body of Christ. But when we don't, we kind of step out and go on our own for a while. And so that's why, in a sense, that's why it's holy. Because when we're not sinning, we're fully part. When we step out and sin, we're not. So I love the fact that our church history shows us that we are full of sinners. And we're still here. Some horrible popes. We embrace that. We don't deny it. I mean, we had some really rotten popes. But in spite of that, they didn't teach heresy. That's what's amazing. You know, and I can tell you, we can give you stories of people who converted because they went and studied and they said, well, I'm going to find a rotten pope after all those popes. There's got to be one who really taught heresy. And there's one that they always bring up, Honorius, and, and it turns out it's bogus, you know. And, and people, when they go and dig into that, and they find, oh, darn. So you know what some of, a lot of them do is they end up going after the church, and they end up becoming Catholic because of that. I love our traditions. You know, and, and our traditions are built upon the Word. You know, some people have this misinterpretation in terms of tradition. It's just something the church is making up as we go along. No, no, no. God gave us the Word, but we have to live out the Word. 
The Word, the Bible, doesn't tell us every little detail of what to do in life. We have to live it out. And we have to learn as we go along. The Bible didn't tell us what to do when artificial insemination came along, you know. <laughs> it wasn't in the list. But the Bible gave us principles, and the church has to interpret that and figure out, okay, how does it apply to these circumstances? That's part of our tradition. <clears throat> so I love our tradition. I love the fact that there's so many spiritual flavors in our church. And, and it's, there's not a cookie-cutter way to be a good Catholic. There's Franciscans. They have a certain kind of spirituality. Dominicans, which tends to be very much out there in the world as a spirituality. And then there's the people who set us, themselves aside and become hermits or monks or cloistered nuns. And God has provided all that as ways to serve Him and be one with Him. So there isn't one way. I happen to like the Ignatian way. And the Ignatian way is basically you don't spend a lot of time in prayer. You pray as you work, as you serve. You try to make that your prayer. You pray some in the morning and some in the evening, but you don't spend a lot of time in prayer like some flavors of spirituality do. You know, there's charismatics. How many of you have heard of charismatics? You know, that's, you know, the church embraces that. There's lot, been lots of movements in different ways to express our spirituality. And the church has got something there for you. I promise you. The church has so many treasures. I always like to tell people who are coming into the church, if you haven't found something that gets you excited about being a Christian, about serving Jesus, then you just haven't found it because it's there. The Catholic Church is full. Oh, we happen to have one spiritual flavor right here in this room. Opus Dei. How many of you heard of that? So there, there are lots of ways that God calls people. There's lots of opportunities. So look around. Keep searching as you go through your journey. And, and you know, one of the dangers is you go through RCIA, you come into the church and you just kind of, okay, go into cruise mode. Don't do that, please. Keep going. Keep looking. Keep searching. Keep growing. I love the fact that the church is not a democracy. Um, if, if it was a democracy, remember what I said, we'd all be Aryans, probably. So I love the fact that there is an authority in the church. I embrace that. I think that's a good and wonderful thing. Orthodoxy, you know, sometimes you'll see this word, and the reason I put it up there is because sometimes this is a dirty word to people. When, when you hear that word, what does it mean to you? Anybody? Rules. Rules. There you go. Well, what else? Rigid, there you go. These are people who've uh, converted too, so. <laughs> or reconverted, as, as Buck would say. <laughs> Reverted. Huh? You know what it means? You know, it means right thinking, right knowledge, you know, orthopraxis, right praxis. Are you doing things right? You know, if you don't know it. it and one of the things that orthodoxy always has to have is always with love. And that's why ortho, if orthodoxy rules, whatever, if there's not love involved, then it's not orthodox. So don't be afraid of that word. Because if, if I'm teaching you, if I'm up here and you think I say something that's not orthodox, you better call me on it. Because I had that happen one time. Somebody misinterpreted because he didn't understand the word. <laughs> And he misinterpreted it and finally got around to me and I was able to show him no, that wasn't heterodox, which would be the opposite of orthodoxy. So, um, you know, if you think I'm teaching something that's crazy, please come up to me. Tell me. Or Father. Any of us. Sometimes we can make a mistake, you know, and say something we didn't mean. So I love the fact that the church does have an authority. Because I believe that authority is God-given. One of the marks that I think far too often we don't fully appreciate and understand 
is the church is apostolic. Well, what does that mean? That means it goes all the way back to the apostles who were there and sat at the feet of Jesus. And if we believe that, that this, our heritage goes all the way back, our tradition goes all the way back, then why don't we want to listen to the authority in the magisterium? Because that's where their grace comes from. I am a bit of a zealot, so... <laughs> I, I really love the fact that the church, as Father Allen said, in term, or McDonald said, in terms of faith and reason, that reason is a big part of our faith. We want you to question. We're not afraid of the questions. Because after 2,000 years, guess what? They've all been asked and answered. So we're not afraid of it. So challenge us, please. And, and the fact that the church is not willing to back down. In fact, to the point of martyrdom on the truth. The church is full of men and women who are willing to die for the truth, for the faith. They weren't going to compromise. I love that example that they set for us. And that the fact that holiness is a part of a calling for all of us. Not just the people who are nuns or priests or deacons or whatever. Holiness is for everybody. Because what does it mean? It means to be like Jesus. <clears throat> what better example is there? I love the fact that the church has given us theology of the body. How many have heard of that? I love it. And the reason I love it is because when Paul VI came out, on artificial contraception, it was, although he, he didn't really say it quite like this, but it tended to come across to people as, thou shalt not. <clears throat> Which, what, what did Jesus, you know, he took the Ten Commandments and said, thou shalt. Thou shalt love God and thou shalt love the na your neighbor, rather than not. Okay? Um, but I love theology of the body because it really explains a whole lot about who we are in terms of God's creation as human beings. It explains the purpose of marriage, our sexuality, and everything. It just really ties it together very well. And I think it's a treasure that will take a while for us to really adopt in the church fully. So when you hear stuff about that, be open to it. It will explain a lot to you.